now we're we're going to to move on into the airport infrastructure financing session. So really excited about this because we've got people from all different sides of the table and all parts of Africa as well. Um, so please allow me to invite Cohen Brinkman, the Director of Airport Strategy and Studies at Netherlands Airport Consultants, Narco, to the stage to moderate this panel. Thanks, John. Thanks, everyone. Good morning to you all. Um, very pleased to be here. As John already mentioned in his opening remarks, normally my colleague Marcel Langeslag would be here. Uh, but apparently he had other priorities, I think a, a honeymoon or a, a marriage. So anyway, when he promoted the event to me, he was very positive and, and so far rightfully so. Um, one of the things he didn't mention uh, was the, the weather conditions last year at the run. Uh, I think he referred to it as, as liquid sunshine. Um, so thankfully this morning uh, we, were we were able to enjoy some actual sunshine. Um, and on behalf of NACO, I just wanted to take also this opportunity to thank everyone who was able to, uh, to join the run this morning and, and make a contribution to a good cause. So now over to the, the topic of this session. Um, as John mentioned, the topic of the session is the financing of airport infrastructure in Africa. Um, before inviting my esteemed panel uh, onto the stage, I'd just like to give a quick introduction uh, on this topic. Uh, in order to set the scene, I've prepared a couple of slides with some, some highlights that I thought were very interesting to, uh, to get things started. So if we can get the first slide up. Probably nothing new here. Um, as we all know, global demand for air travel is, is increasing rapidly. Uh, ACI estimates that in 2018, the total passenger traffic in the world amounted to roughly uh, almost 9 billion passengers. So that's up by a very healthy 6% growth compared to the previous year. And that growth is also expected to continue in the coming decades. So a very robust growth rate of roughly 4% um, looking forward. So what does that mean effectively? Um, Traffic will double, to, will double in 2034 um, and increase even further to roughly 22 billion passengers in 2040, which is just, to me, a, a staggering amount of, of, of passenger traffic. So now focusing our, our attention on, on the continent here, um, also characterized by, by strong growth since the beginning of the century, albeit at a somewhat smaller, smaller scale, so in 2017, passenger traffic reached almost 200 million, um, and an average growth, road, growth rate of 4% since, since 2000. And also the outlook here is, is very positive, and not ignoring the, uh, the challenges that, we, that we're facing here, and that have also been touched upon earlier uh, this morning as well as yesterday, in terms of open skies and, and ongoing liberalization. Uh, but the underlying socioeconomic drivers uh, of demand for air travel are also very robust here. So population, obviously very important in terms of the potential pool of travelers, is expected to increase by, by 40% in the coming 10 years, reaching almost 1.7, should read 1.7 billion uh, around 2030. And the economy is also predicted to grow robustly at almost 4% in the coming decade. So as a result, IATA, in, in one of their forecasts, predicted that the air transport market in Africa will grow by almost 5% through 2037. So basically that means air traffic here on the continent is expected to double every, uh, every 15 years. And this is actually under a, what they call a, a constant policy scenario, so that doesn't fully reflect uh, the potential upside that, for instance, open skies would, would bring to the continent. So all of this, this, this is a very positive story. Um, and in general, this kind of growth is, is beneficial for airport owners, uh, operators, airlines, passengers, uh, as it brings increased revenues, uh, increased air connectivity, uh, increasing social economic benefits. Um, it also means we continuously need to make sure that our infrastructure is able to grow in line with the demand. 
uh, if not growing demand in, in combination with capacity challenges uh, will lead to delays, congestion, uh, and a decreased passenger experience. So therefore, in order to, to cope with this increasing demand, we need to invest in our, in our airport infrastructure. Now, the traditional way of funding, uh, not only here in, in, in Africa, uh, but pretty much elsewhere in the world, has been relying on government budgets. Um, so this graph shows you the breakdown of the different funding sources for investments in the, in the, in the transport sector. So this is the entire transport sector. Uh, but a similar picture um, can be painted for the aviation. And you see that almost 60% of, uh, of investments are done by the, the national budgets. Now, as we see elsewhere, is that government budgets are, have increasingly limited resources um, to devote to increased capital expenditures for infrastructure projects. Uh, they have many competing priorities um, and sometimes restrictions on their ability to raise, to raise debt and to raise financing. So therefore, we need to explore alternative sources of, of financing, whether it's through commercial loans, private sector participation, uh, IFIs or, or a hybrid form. So in this, in this session on, on airport financing or financing of airport infrastructure, uh, we're going to explore the different options that there are for, uh, for, in, for financing infrastructure projects. So I'm very, very happy with our panel. As John mentioned, it's a very uh, diverse panel uh, coming from different sides of the table. Um, so please join me in welcoming them to the stage. So before we really start into our discussions, I think most of you already have been involved in successful financing projects on the continent. Um, so my, my first question would be, uh, starting with you, Fundi, um, if you can already share with the audience some of the highlights of, of or success stories of the financing projects you've been involved in. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Um, so as Airports Company South Africa, the last real um, large build program that we experienced was in the period between 2008 and 2010, um, where we saw a large number of capacity being introduced into our network of airports, namely out of Cape Town, or Tamba International, a Greenfields Airport um, in Durban, King Shaga International Airport. And that cost us probably in the region of about 17 billion rands, roughly around um, 1.5 US billion dollars. Um, and that was a range of funding, some of it through our balance sheet, some of it through some DFI funding, as well as um, um, the, the bond market. Um, and we've since been able to, over that time, because we haven't really done anything in between in terms of infrastructure since then, we were able to repay the loans quite mm -hmm. quick. So that's a, a success story for us, obviously, because it's a um, lesser, lesser cost burden. Yeah. Um, so we've paid about um, 17, 10 billion rands of that. Um, out of the 17 billion rands, and now we're now gearing up for the next big cycle. So we are now ready for the next big push of around 22 billion rands over the next five years, and it's going to follow a similar funding structure just to introduce more capacity to look at those numbers that, that you showed us earlier on. Sounds good. Nicola? Good, first, good morning to, to everyone. Uh, so I will specifically talk about the project where we are involved in Madagascar. Uh, we have, it's, it's a very nice story because uh, we have started to work on this project six or seven years ago and we have signed a concession agreement at the beginning of uh, 2017. Uh, historically, historically, ADB was involved in the country. At the time, the public operator was operating all airports in Madagascar. It was 20, 30 years ago. And after a certain number of, of, of years, uh, as there was a huge uh, demand of uh, air transport in Madagascar, because it is a big country with a uh, very poor uh, road uh, infrastructure, uh, the government decided to do three things. One, to privatize the airport uh, through a concession scheme. Two, to restructure the national flag carrier, and three, to apply an open sky policy. And 
the decision was taken in 2014. They launched a tender, an international tender, and we won the, the tender. And in early 2017, we signed the contract. Since that time, uh, you know, to, uh, to start the project, we uh, took on board some five development banks, DBSA from South Africa, EAIF, the French Poparco, IFC, and uh, the OFID, the bank of the OPEC uh, uh, group. So the deal was, when the deal was signed, uh, the main uh, characteristic of the deal was an investment, a total investment in, uh, to, to, of around 220 million uh, uh, euros for the development of two airports, the one in the capital city and another one in Nosy Bay in the north of uh, Madagascar. After two years, so it's a very young concession because we have only started two years ago, it's a, a 28 years contract. Uh, everything is, is very, very, very positive. Uh, relationship with the government are very, very good. Traffic growth is increasing, is, is, is really uh, increasing very strongly. We have more than uh, 10 to 12 percent since the last two years. And airlines, uh, some airlines have started to operate uh, in, in, in Madagascar, like uh, uh, Ethiopian, Kenyan have strongly increased their frequencies. We are having some discussions with some other airlines to increase their frequencies and to, and to come to Madagascar. So today, it's a, I think it's a very good example of what we can do in a, in a difficult country, in a difficult environment, uh, with a, a private investor, without receiving any subsidy from the government. I will come back to it. Yeah, good morning. Uh, today I'm representing the World Bank in my capacity as private sector liaison officer. Uh, the World Bank is active in Africa quite heavily, and spe specifically in the infrastructure sector, because that's a key sector for the growth on the continent. And the infrastructure is mainly then the airports. So the World Bank is uh, financing airports through the means of loans via its department IDA, but also through investments, like the through the department of the IFC. And probably the most recent and uh, nice success with IFC are the uh, co-financing or co-investment in the airports of uh, two airports in Madagascar, together with the consortium which is led by Aéroport de Paris. So you share the same success story, yeah. Exactly. Okay. It's no coincidence we are sitting <laughs> yeah, in each other. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, Olivier? Yes, good morning everyone. So I'm from uh, Aegis. Aegis is uh, an engineering and consulting <coughs> French group uh, doing um, in rail, in the road, energy, water. And in the road and airport, we are uh, operators as well and partner operators. And in Africa, our history started in uh, 1988 in Gabon when we uh, started and set up probably the first historical PPP in airport in, uh, in Africa that ended in October last year. So we handed over to a new partner of the Gabon State with whom we, we, we collaborate. Then in 1996, we set up Aérea, Aéroport d'Abidjan, which is the concessionaire of the, uh, the Aéroport of Abidjan. And uh, in 2010, we started the operation of three airports in Congo, Brazzaville, Pointe Noire, and Olombo in the same setup, so we have a common vehicle with AIIM that Moritz will present, will introduce, which is an investment vehicle and uh, throughout, uh, through which we, uh, we provide the um, services to, to airports and uh, deliver the, the quality of services to airlines and, uh, and all stakeholders. Uh, thanks, Olivier, and uh, good morning, everyone. Um, maybe worth just uh, explaining in one or two sentences who AIM is. African Infrastructure Investment Managers is a private equity fund dedicated to infrastructure uh, investment across the continent, as the, as the name suggests. Um, so we really invest across all infrastructure subsectors. We've invested in uh, power, both conventional and renewable energy. Uh, we've invested in the port space, telecommunication infrastructure, roads, and uh, last year, finally, we've made an investment in the African airport space. As uh, Olivier said, um, we invested in a company called um, Segap, which is really uh, an African airport operator and bundling uh, uh, Aegis's uh, involvement in African airports to date. Uh, it used to include the 
concession of Libreville, which is, uh, which is unfortunately expired. Um, but it still includes the airports of Abidjan and, and Pointe Noire and, and Brazzaville. Um, and we were really excited about this investment opportunity uh, because it included both an, a portfolio of existing and operating airports, and we found a very strong partner, a strong technical partner in Egis, um, who own the other 50% of, of SIGAP, and who've obviously got a lot of experience uh, in operating airports across the world. Okay, thank you. So, well, we already heard a number of, I would say, pretty successful stories of private sector participation in, in, in airport development here on the continent. The figure I showed earlier um, showed that the, the, the involvement of the private sector is still relatively small as opposed to, let's say, the 60% of, uh, of funding from, from, mm -hmm. from uh, government budgets. So my question to you, how do you see that evolving over time uh, given the, the strong growth in traffic that we're seeing or expecting at least in the coming decades, uh, as well as the development that uh, more and more go governments are facing uh, shrinking budgets or have more priorities just than, uh, than airports only. Um, Moritz, can I start with you? Uh, sure, and uh, I can just add a couple of numbers. Uh, I mean, we've seen your numbers there. I think around 11% uh, of traffic by traffic volume to date, airports in Africa involve private sector uh, capital. And I think John mentioned yesterday, let's be positive and let's have a, a can-do attitude. And um, I think that just shows that there's a lot of potential. Uh, there's 89% that we can still tap. Uh, and I think that the private sector can uh, provide a lot of um, yeah, benefits and opportunities uh, <coughs> to, the, to the public sector and working together. And um, we, are, we, can, we can explore those uh, together. And I think the benefits go beyond just financing. I think that's important to mention because mm. uh, the, the private sector can also bring a lot of expertise, a lot of operational experience, can transfer knowledge from its uh, international operations and also um, support in group functions that maybe don't work on a standalone basis in a specific airport. Mm -hmm. yeah, for, yeah, I, I, I totally agree. And, uh, I think we cannot oppose the public uh, investment and the private investment. When, when, we see your, your, when we saw your figures, we can see that there is a huge demand in air transport. Airports are very capital intensive. It's getting, I'm sure, due to the rules, new rules, due to the environment, airports will need even more money than what was required a, a few years ago. So there is a room for everyone, I think. And it's very important to work together because uh, as a private investor, of course, we can bring money. But I think the money for, for us is not the main issue. Money, if you, want to, if you have a good project, if you have a good feasibility study, if there is a, a government who knows exactly what he wants, I'm sure to find money is very easy. To find money is very easy. After, it's just a willingness you know, to, to go in this direction and to and to, and to try to, to, to bring some new expertise in order to improve the operations, not only for the benefit of the airport operator, but for the benefit of the country, for the benefit of, of, our, of our clients, airlines, for the benefit of the population. I think it is one, one very important thing for us. It's what, on our side, it's what we do in, uh, to try to do in our projects, is to have a, a group of people we can work with, who are very serious, uh, and, and we can bring all these elements uh, in, a, in, a, in a project. And, and, and I also want to add that, uh, uh, that uh, it, airport privatization or airport concession project, uh, it does not go alone. Uh, liberalization of air traffic is very important because why for me coming here today, if tomorrow morning, you know, I go back to Madagascar and I'm told, oh no, for the traffic rights, you know, to go here, it's not possible, here it's not possible, here, it's, so it's better to stay at home and, uh, and just operating my airport. So I think it's, it's very important, you know, to have several things together in order, you know, to, to push the development of the airport, to push the development of, the, of, uh, of our industry. I also think that we have an amazing situation on the African continent for the moment. The financing is the bottleneck for the airports, but on the other side, capital is available. Mm. Um, we also realize that there is a tendency for private-public partnership, but to get private-public partnership, 
we need to have the political will to go for it. Mm -hmm. And that's another bottleneck, it's the political will. Uh, we see the tendency in India, where many airports are privatized, and the uh, aviation industry is booming in India. Something same can happen on the continent in Africa. But as Nicola said, there is a liberalization need, uh, there is a political will. Uh, yesterday on a panel, somebody told, um, well, the airports, they will follow the business. But the business follows first <coughs> the political situation. So once there's a liberalized market, the business will grow up and then the airport industry will get the financing required from the private sector because the private sector is also looking for feasibility studies and they will only invest into airports when it's feasible. Yeah. Yeah, I think that, Olivier, you want yes, to say something? Yes, I think there is another reason of the slow uh, pace of develop, development of the PPPs in airports in Africa and anywhere else in the world is the perception that in a way, it's a, it's a loss of sovereignty that you will transfer your assets, your main gateway to, to the private sector, which is perceived as eager to make profits. And uh, so th this is a really a wrong perception because on, on the contrary, when you, are, when you create a PPP, you have your other partner, the public partner, uh, jointly with you in the same uh, board meetings, in the same uh, decision-making processes. So it, on the contrary, involves more the, pri the public sector in the decision of the private. So, um, and it, it's the same in, uh, in France as well. The, the, we have uh, big arguments those days about the privatization of uh, ADP. So it's not typical to Africa. But there is a, a permanent reluctancy of um, uh, ha handed over to the, to the private sector because as a perception of a loss of sovereignty, I think. So maybe if I can add on that, because ours is a bit of an, an anomaly and a, and a good anomaly. Um, because as much as um, AXA is majority government owned. Um, however, we are very much independent in terms of how we source our financing for all our infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So we rely heavily very much on the, 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 the PPP, um, the partnerships. And for us, it's at the end of the day, we've got to find the most cost effective capital structure. Um, so it's not necessarily about, you know, what part are you giving away from a, a, a mm. concession perspective. We are very clear we need to expand and it has to be at the most cost-effective price. Um, so what does it mean? It's DFI funding, it's private sector funding, etc. cetera. Mm. We, we are very much open to that because at the core of it is we are at the realization that we have to increase the capacity mm. into, into our airports. And that's it. Mm. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, good, good point. I think um, what we're seeing is that private sector participation can absolutely be one option yeah. for, for funding. Um, one of the things I picked up yesterday, uh, it was in one of the panels, that for airlines there's already a, a high cost environment to operate here. Um, and then obviously you have the, you know, as an investor coming in uh, with certain requirements in terms of profitability, um, that charges would go up uh, and that PPPs actually do not bring the efficiency gains or the, um, the benefits that, uh, that traditionally are expected. So, what, Nicolas, what is your, your view on that? Uh, I would like to see the figures, but uh, <laughs> I would like to see the figures. Uh, I, I don't know if it is. The only thing I can, I, I can see uh, it is that in our airports, uh, we can, during the last years, the traffic has uh, very strongly increased. It's not only the case in Madagascar, but we also operate airports in Turkey, we operate airports in, in Chile, in some other countries. So I, so I think you know, it's not really uh, because of the rates, uh, even if at the very early stage of the beginning of a concession, you need to make sure that you will be able to pay back the lenders, you will be able you know, to do a, a operation uh, at the international standard, and at the end of the day, of course, because they are shareholders, you need, uh, you need to pay them back. But at the same time, you bring something else, you bring a service. It's not only to pay for, for nothing, it's, you bring a service. So if you bring a service, if you can, uh, you know, like today, uh, try to convince airlines to come and to spend money, you know, in order to do road development, I, we think it's a good thing for the country. So it's, it depends when you pay something, what your money is going to be used for. And I think it's very important. It's why when you do a project like, like we try to do, when we, uh, in Madagascar, just to give you an example, before signing the contract, we, uh, we, we had 
to change the level of the passenger service charge. We created a committee with the airlines, with the government, with ourselves, to explain what was the project, to make sure that, you know, uh, that right after signing the contract, we would not have any you know, clients or people telling us, okay, no, it's not, we don't want to come any longer, or, you know, it's, uh, the level of the rates, the new rates are going to be too high for us. So we did create this committee. So it was accepted by, by, by everyone. So I think there is a, a, a need of everyone to talk together to make sure that we all go in the same direction. Uh, and, and for me, it is the main, my main message. We have to talk together to make sure that everything is understood by everyone. If I may maybe add one point, um, I think we were also facing a similar problem that the uh, airlines themselves are facing in that uh, it's very costly to operate infrastructure and African airports by comparison are very small uh, mm -hmm. compared to international uh, benchmarks. Uh, so we've got a higher cost and we've got lower traffic to sort of use, the, use to offset those costs or revenues that contribute to offsetting those costs. Um, so I think it really comes down to a question. We had a panel yesterday, which was, which is the right aircraft for Africa? And I think we could similarly have a panel, which is the right airport for Africa? Because we have much smaller operating environments and really, really need to find an investment and operating model um, that, that takes that into account and makes a smaller airport economically viable. Yeah, just continuing on that last point, I think it's for the larger airports who have a certain scale of operations and certain revenue streams, it's perhaps easier to obtain certain uh, financing sources. Um, how, as an investor, how, how do you look at the more the, the smaller airports and how, how do you make those uh, business cases work? I think uh, it's you have a, a good track record in, in, in yeah. investing in smaller airports and making it mm. profitable. The trick is to, I think, to refrain the temptation to build too quickly the maximum capacity. So the, the in-time capacity is key. Uh, and the, the alignment with the airlines is another, another key element. If we, I believe, if we want to develop regional aviation, we need to have a proper airports which are able to be uh, paid by the, by the traffic. And that, as uh, uh, Maurice was mentioning, the, the smaller the traffic is, the smarter the airport has to be uh, in terms of investments. We were speaking yesterday about the air bridges, which is considered sometimes as a, as a must-have. No, it's a nice to have an air bridge in a mm. certain climates. You, because when you have an air bridge, you need to operate it, you need to pay for it, uh, to maintain it, and you need to push back your aircraft. So the whole cost of the, the having an air bridge is extremely expensive. So it, it's a fundamental decision when you decide to fit your terminal building with the uh, air bridges, uh, it's, it has to be uh, in line with the uh, airline operation and the airline model. So typically this type of decision for small airport is key and the longer you keep self-maneuvering uh, aircraft on domestic airport, to me the, the, the better. Yeah, so I think what you're looking for as an investor is, is a, a, a rational and, and, and fit for purpose design. Um, Nicola, from you, I... Yeah, no, may, may I add something? Uh, again, I, I come back to uh, our project in Madagascar, because in, Ma in Madagascar today you have around 12 to 13 uh, commercial uh, airports, where you have some commercial traffic. Uh, you have, I would say, two main ones, the one that we operate, and you have all the others, which are very, very small. Of course, you know, as you can imagine, uh, uh, when we sign the contract, the uh, previous public operator told to everyone, oh, they are going to take the big ones, and after we'll have to manage the small ones, but we have no money, we have nothing. So we had, uh, I think, a very frank and, and deep discussions with the government. And what was decided, it was when we uh, define the level of, uh, of passenger charge, it is to allocate a revenue sharing in order to finance the operation of the other airports. At the same, and so we discussed also so with a with public operator. And there was an agreement between the public operator and, uh, and the state to define you know, how high has to be you know, this, uh, this revenue sharing. And today, every year, you know, a part of our revenues are provided to the, to the government and dedicated to the other airport. It was, uh, to the other, it was very important for us, dedicated to the other, to the other airport to make, sure, to make sure that 
all the other airports are, are going to work properly because at the end of the day, you know, a big country, if you have a, a very good international airport, uh, if you don't know, if you cannot send you know, aircraft to the other airports in the, in the, in the country, it's, ab it's absolutely useless. So it is something that we took from the beginning and uh, during the coming years, we'll uh, have to, uh, this uh, revenue sharing will increase. If we increase uh, the profit of the company, will increase at the same time the revenue generated to the other airports. There's the perception in the market that airports which have less than one million passengers are not profitable. Five years ago, there were only a few uh, airports in Africa which had more than one million passengers. In the meantime, they are popping up. It shows that the regional airports are becoming more and more dedicated. Mm -hmm. And investors are also looking into regional airports because on the hub airports, uh, many airports are built only one hour flight time from each other, so they will face a huge competition which you don't have specifically in regional airports. And the aim is not to build bigger, but to build better. You can accommodate a traffic with the right uh, effort lighting systems uh, in order to, to code the traffic without having a huge capex to include. So there are means to develop the regional airports in order to make them more profitable and to increase the traffic. And many of these airports are existing. I remember Abidjan a few years ago was uh, below one million passengers. And look at the airport now, it's a growing tendency. Mm -hmm. yeah, same for Abato. Yeah. That's a good point. I think also the, the airports that are now have four or 500,000 passengers, if you look at the growth figures, in a couple of years will have that critical base mm -hmm. to, be, to be successful. Mm -hmm. um, Sorry, maybe if I can just also come on that. Course. Because we, within our network, we've got a good mixture. Right, we've got the three international airports and you've got the six what we call regional airports. So for us, it acts, it's, it's worked perfectly because then you really effectively use your hub and spoke. So you hub into Aura Tambo International Airport and soon Cape Town International Airport with the numbers. And the traffic from there starts to feed into the regional airport. So we are very deliberate in that we don't start to look at airport um, uh, profitability per airport, we rather look, look at the entire system. network because you want the network to be as, as efficient as possible. So, so that's a deliberate strategy from our perspective. Mm. Good point, good point. Mm. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you, Alexander, is um, there are still airports that have a relatively small base and, and, and that are in that sense struggling to, to generate sufficient streams. So what can the World Bank do, and what can the World Bank bring in those cases to help those airports reaching uh, the required level? Yeah. Well, the World Bank, first of all, is a developing bank. So it's looking into the developing, uh, develop development of, of the country and of, of the nation. That means the World Bank will also look into airport projects, which might be not profitable in the first sense. Uh, this mainly through loans, but then we are talking about the public sector. Mm -hmm. For the private sector, the World Bank is also looking into financing, investing into airports. But since the World Bank is uh, such as other banks as well is, uh, is, a, is a bank which needs to, to see also the feasibility study, uh, the World Bank will not specifically uh, finance and invest into airports which on the long term will not be profitable. So there are two arms, of course. The arm of the loan, which will look in the developing side, maybe even in regions which are for the airports not uh, profitable on the long term, but on the investment side, uh, will act as any other bank and also look in the profitability and feasibility of this project. And, uh, but it's looking more and more also with uh, co-investing, because the big tendency nowadays, it's no more like 10 years ago where there's only one developing bank financing a project. The tendency goes to co-financing and co-investment, mm -hmm. uh, like it's the case in Madagascar as well, where there are in fact five financing institutions involved uh, in the consortium, in the investment in the consortium. Yeah. Uh, Alexander mentioned a key point is the fact that World Bank and financial institution may subsidize feasibility studies. And for us as an investor, when we see coming on the market mm. uh, an airport PPP project without an advisor, yeah. we, we are not so keen on, on investing a lot of money because bidding on a PPP project is extremely costly. It's a long process. And having a well-structured project, well-advised in advance, which makes it at the end of the day uh, financially viable and, and closable because at the end of the day you can sign a commercial contract very easily with a, with a government. That's something uh, that contractors know how to do. Uh, but making it, making it uh, financially uh, feasible with all the investors on board is, is another thing. So 
Yeah, thank you, Olivier, for raising it up. Uh, also, the World Bank is providing advisory services uh, in the airport sector. Um, I would say one big advantage of having the World Bank on the boat in the financing is uh, the World Bank is represented by 194 countries. So uh, wherever the World Bank is uh, co-investing active, I think the other investor will feel the advantage of having the big support which may be also a political support somehow, or diplomatic support, and having the World Bank in the boat, and uh, having somehow also the investment secured. I think this is also one of the big advantage of the international financing institution. I'm talking on behalf of the World Bank, but it can also be the African Development Bank, or even sometimes the bilateral financing institutions. Yeah, I, 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 I want to confirm this point. I think it's very important. As an airport operator, uh, I don't do politics. I only operate my airport. Uh, so it means that we, in Madagascar, we had a presidential election uh, uh, last, at the end of last year. So in many countries in Africa, when you have some election, you know, sometimes you say, oh, what, what would happen? So fortunately, uh, during the last uh, election in, uh, in Madagascar, everything was very smooth, absolutely no problem. But, but every time, you know, we, we needed some, some help and some support from the World Bank. The World Bank was with us, you know, to try to help, to convince the government that what we wanted to do is the interest of the country and not only our interest. And I think it's very important. Uh, so, in, in addition, we have five other, uh, you know, development banks. So it's even much easier for us, but uh, with the World Bank, uh, we, we had a, a great support, you know, when it comes to this point. And maybe to add, while I can only second the importance of international funding and expertise coming into the continent, because I think it can, can add a lot of uh, value, really, I think. Uh, on AIM's side, we're proud that we can also bring a little bit of African capital to the mix and, and African know-how. Personally, I'm German, so I'm not the best representation, but uh, the majority of our team uh, are Africans. We are only based in Africa, across uh, South Africa, Kenya, Nigeria, and, and Cote d'Ivoire. We've invested in 16 countries across the continent, and while it's probably more sort of a next step in the future, we're trying to, to leverage more and more capital, for example, through our um, uh, mother company or mutual. We're trying to leverage local balance sheets, and I think that will also in the future play a big role in uh, financing infra infrastructure projects. Um, I think we still have a couple of minutes left. I was just wondering maybe if someone from the audience has a question for our panel. I see one over there. Hi, uh, my name is Richard Powell. I'm, I'm representing a uh, new low-cost airline in West Africa. However, previous life, I was working in air traffic control in, in Europe, and there's a huge uh, program called the Single European Sky. And there are 30,000 flights per day <clears throat> in Europe. So the future of the, the airport is really collaborative decision making, which works with with airport airlines, air traffic control, and they, they understand what's going on because the airports are now businesses competing against each other. So the future, they have to work together to make sure airlines can run efficiently. So as a low-cost airline, we need to have ex the best efficiency of the airport and in, in the air. So that's my job to make sure that happens. So for you guys, how, how do you see the performance of airports uh, being measured? We've got measurements in, in Europe, and I'm pretty sure it's probably more efficient there. Um, if an airline's going to succeed, they have to keep the cost down, they have to turn around efficiently, they have to have things in the right place at the right time. How do you see the performance of the airports in the future in, in Africa? And is it something that when you invest, you look at how it's going to be measured in the future and how you meet the requirements of the airline, which is kind of flexibility, predictability during poor weather, things like that. Do, do you measure performance? Mm. Yeah. On, on, on our side, yes, the reply is, is, is yes. Uh, and we even have in our concession agreement some obligation to measure our performance, to follow international standards and to apply some uh, uh, every year, you know, to do some, uh, to, this, to, to make this measurement uh, and the one which is uh, provided by ACI. So we have to do it, I think, after the year three of the, after the beginning of our concession agreement, when we'll have almost completed our main investment. Uh, 
but yes, we have to do this, and, 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 and even more what we do, uh, and we have started the uh, middle of next year, uh, of last year, sorry, uh, we have some meetings with airlines, with the main airlines, to share, you know, uh, our performance, because we know very well that on their side, so big airlines like British Airways or Air France, you know, they, they have their own uh, system to measure the performance of the airports, and we share information with them. Um, so maybe if I can, your, your precursor to that the, um, question was, was spot on, right? Um, because gone are the days where you just provide infrastructure for the sake of providing infrastructure, right? So it's got to be cost effective, it's got to be process efficient, and at the end of the day, we have to ensure that apart from making it um, operationally as um, KPI effective as possible, but you've got to pass on the efficiencies through to the airlines as well as to the passengers. So on a daily basis, those, those are KPIs. Um, you, you have to provide what is structurally fit for your end users. Um, we can't just sit as, as a, an airport operator and just construct as we, as we see fit, gone are those days. So it is a very good balance that we have to reach between what we expect of the airlines and what airlines expect out of us, but similarly what we want to add on in terms of the passenger, passenger journey, and as well as us making sure that we really sweat our assets as efficiently as possible. Mm. I mean, I've no, I, know, I know that um, AXA has now got kind of MOU with airports of Thailand, which is the biggest airport operator in the world. And I worked there in Thailand recently, so I know they've got huge issues of managing the growth in Asia in terms of Chinese traffic coming into Thailand, etc. So, and now we're a much more connected world. So there are not just efficiencies within Africa, within South Africa. I mean, Africa is a huge continent, but within the relationships with other continents as well. So these connectivity and efficiencies they affect airlines, and they go under, especially low-cost airlines, if they can't meet their targets. So it's extremely important for the regional airlines to be uh, as efficient as the big ones. And we've got a big mixed equipage problem in, in Africa, so that means, you know, if you were in a modern aircraft, you could be a problem with, with, a, with, a, with a, an old aircraft causing a problem in, in, the, in the chain. So there's a lot of things around performance which I think could be... I also believe that uh, roles which used to be very separated, airlines, airports, ATCs, finances, local community and so on, are getting more and more integrated. And uh, communication is key in this uh, airport and aviation sector. And uh, therefore, everybody, uh, every airline, whatever is the size, need to, to be considered and involved in this setup. OK. Thank you. I'm afraid that's all the time we, uh, we have for the sessions. So I want I'd like to thank the audience for, 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 for your attention. Uh, please join me in giving the, the panel a big round of applause. Thank you.